During the COVID epidemic, a young boy did his classes online. On his first day at that experience, his mother set the computer up for him and set him in front of it just as his teacher began her lesson. And then she tiptoed away to do some household chores. About 10 minutes later, she thought she would check back in on him. And when she did, she found him watching a movie. What are you doing, she demanded. He explained, I'm tired of listening to her. (laughs) We understand that, don't we? But most of us would agree that a six-year-old has a poor understanding of the need and the value of an education. School isn't about doing what we want at the moment. It is listening and studying and reading and memorizing in order to grow intellectually. It requires discipline, disciplining ourselves to learn in that way. Two weeks ago, I attended a three-day preaching conference in Chicago. The second day was way too long. I sat and listened to seven preachers that day. Seven preachers who obviously don't wear watches. I sat through seven one-hour-long sermons. They were preached by giants in the profession, and they were all excellent. But sitting through seven hours of preaching is a challenge. By mid-afternoon, my head literally was pounding. I concluded that heaven will certainly not be spent listening to countless preachers deliver sermon after sermon. Aren't you glad to hear that? I'm glad to hear that. It took discipline for me to make myself stay for the final two sessions of the day. Now, why would I do that? I have been in this profession for 49 years. Why would I still put myself through a grueling experience like that? It's because I'm still learning and growing. That conference was good for me. There are a couple of principles that we can draw from those two stories I just told you about our relationship with God's church. It is good for us to be here together. God gave us the church and made it a part of his plan for us for good reason. Let's look at the way the Apostle Peter described the church in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. He tells us in this verse that when we come to Christ, we not only join him, but we also join one another. He says that we, in fact, are built together, not by human hands, but by God's own hands. We are living stones that are stacked and cemented and and forged together to comprise a spiritual house, meaning the church, that togetherness is what the church is all about that togetherness is further described by peter a few verses later in that chapter when we read this in verse 10 once you were not a people but now you are the people of god once you had not received mercy but now you have received mercy once you were not a people peter wrote not that we weren't human but that we weren't a people group, like a tribe, bonded together, united with something common, until we became one with God in our relationship with him. Then we also became one with each other. That's the nature of God's church. The church is the people of God together, practicing our faith in community, Worshiping together, serving together, on a spiritual journey together as a people, not as separate individuals. One of my favorite stories illustrates this point. 
Do you remember the cute little exercise many of us were taught as children involving our hands and forming a church building of sorts? Do you remember we were taught this is the church and this is the steeple? I'll turn around. Open the doors and see all the people. How many of you remember that? Now, probably if you were under the age of 30, you're saying, what? You see, back in the day, we didn't have computers. We didn't have e-games. We didn't have cell phones. Our TVs only pulled three stations, and most of our televisions were black and white. So we had to do something to entertain ourselves. So we came up with cute little exercises like that to make a point. Well, it was during that period of time that a Sunday school teacher was leading her class of seven and eight-year-olds through that little exercise to make the point. And so she began, this is the church and here's the steeple, and then she stopped because she remembered that one of the little boys in her class only had one arm. She was horrified at the thought that he would be embarrassed Or that this exercise would draw attention to his disability and his heart would be saddened. He couldn't couldn't participate along with the rest of the children. And so she turned over to look at him to see how he was reacting. And she noticed that the little girl sitting next to him had put her right hand up to his left hand. And they had interlocked fingers. And they were going through the exercise. And the little girl exclaimed, look, teacher, Jimmy and I are making a church together. That's what church is about. We are here now making a church together. It is God's plan that the church grows in this togetherness. That's what the church is. Today we begin a nine-week sermon series on the church. You might wonder why we would spend so much time studying the church as an institution when 25% of American people uh, attend it on a given Sunday and 75% do not. It's because God values the church. Did you know that most of the New Testament was written about and for the church? After the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have the book of Acts, which is a history of the church being planted throughout the Roman Empire. And then after the book of Acts, we read letter after letter written to various churches or leaders of churches. For example, we can read the letter that was written to the church in Rome. And the letters written to the churches in Corinth and Thessalonica. We can read the letter written to the church in Ephesus. The one written to the church in Philippi. The one written to the church in Colossae. The one written uh, to all the churches throughout the province of Galatia. The book of Hebrews was a letter that was written to the church in Jerusalem. James was written as a general letter to churches scattered throughout the Roman Empire. First and second John were written a a letter written to an unnamed church, but it was probably the church in Ephesus where John spent most of his elder years. Third John was written to the leader of an unnamed church, and it was probably that same church in Ephesus. First and second Timothy and Titus and Philemon were written to leaders of churches. The book of Revelation was written as a letter to be circulated among all of the churches. John named seven of them specifically in chapters 2 through 4. Peter wrote two circular letters to churches in five Roman provinces, which he named. And Jude wrote a general letter to all churches. And that is every book in the New Testament. The point is, the church was front and center in God's mind as he inspired the New Testament to be written. You see, the New Testament is first about Jesus and then second about his church. The church is of great value in God's eyes. May we hold the church in equal value. The Greek word that's used throughout the New Testament scriptures for our English word church is pronounced ekklesia. Ekklesia. Say that along with me. 
ecclesia. It means the called together of God. When God chose the word to describe his people, he intended to convey the idea that we are summoned together. We are the called together. We are the ecclesia of God. We've been summoned to gather in order to worship and to serve and to encourage each other and to grow spiritually in a spirit of togetherness. That's God's plan for his church. You see, he has a purpose for our being here in assembly. Even if we have been doing that for a long period of time, there is still continued value in our being together. That's what God envisioned for his church and what he wants for us. And that's why he called this society of faith the ecclesia, the called together. God summons us to gather as a people. That word, ecclesia, appears more than 100 times in the New Testament. Only a few of those times does it clearly refer to what is called the universal church. That is, the church comprised of all of God's people in all places over all ages, the invisible church. 92 times the word ecclesia in the New Testament refers to the local congregation. This teaches us that it is God's will for us to gather together. The church is an assembly of those who belong to the kingdom of God. We have received a summons from him to gather. The church has always been devalued by atheists and agnostics and secular humanists who think that it is an archaic institution with outdated morals. Criticism of the church from those verses does not concern me much. I understand their lack of of understanding. They are not experts on spiritual matters. But what does concern me is that God's church has in more recent times become devalued by the very people he called to be part of it. Some decades ago, many Christians who did not want to give God even the least commitment of their faith by attending church regularly offered the belief that going to church doesn't make anyone a Christian. They cited examples of active church members who were living unchristian lives through the week. Obviously, they were not converted by their going to church, so they reasoned church must not be necessary. After all, they countered, faith resides in the heart, not in a building. Some 15 years ago or so, As that thought continued to become more and more popular, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian, fewer people were attending churches. And youth programs, specifically sports programs, began to do something that they had always stopped short of doing before, trespassing on the Sunday morning hour. Now, leagues are played and tournaments are scheduled and recitals are presented on Sunday mornings because... So few people go. So few people care. And Christian parents who do care are made to believe that if they do not take advantage of these programs for their children, they will miss an opportunity that is vital to their development. And so for some, church has become something to do when there is nothing else to do on Sunday morning. They're not committed to the ecclesia, the assembly of God's people. In 2020, I told our leadership that we would probably lose several families when the COVID epidemic swept our nation. COVID phobia ran rampant. COVID phobia has since died out in the minds of the reasonable, but that two-year panic that accompanied that flu 
broke connections for some people with the ecclesia of God. At least 15 families have not yet returned to this church and probably never will. One of those families met with me a little over a year ago and explained how the COVID shutdown taught them a new way of doing church. Now they explain they can sit at home in the comfort, in comfort on their own couch and watch church on their computer. They misunderstand the ecclesia, the called together. They aren't doing church. They may be doing a personal spiritual journey of their own, but it isn't God's church they are doing. The church is the called together of God. It's still suggested by many that we don't need to go to church to be a Christian. But if we avoid the ecclesia, we are not participating in God's church. Jesus, in his one reference to the church, called it my church. As he said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it or overcome it. The church is later referred to in other books of the New Testament as the bride of Christ. There are a couple of examples for you to see uh, of that concept. That, that term, the bride of Christ, was applied to the church to signify the intimate love Jesus has for his church. Another term is often used or is used a few times in the New Testament to refer to the church. It's the body of Christ. Here's one example of that. That term, the body of Christ, applied to the church is indicative that the church is part of him. Can we really believe that we can disassociate ourselves from the body of Christ and still be in relationship with him? Can we disrespect the bride of Christ and believe he isn't offended? Can we turn our backs on his church, sending him the message that my fishing boat or my son's ball game or my mattress and pillow are more important than your church and expect Jesus to accept that? Can we disobey God's command to keep the Sabbath day holy as if it is a lesser commandment than those which prohibit stealing or lying or committing adultery or taking his name in vain and expect God to disregard that disobedience? Can we reject God's will for our lives and expect him to believe it when we call him Lord? Doesn't the term Lord mean that we accept his will without questioning it? And do we really believe that old lie? You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Satan authored that lie. And he has used it for generations to distance countless people from God. We are the called together by God. We are his church. When we answer that call, that summons to gather, he blesses our lives in numerous ways. An active participant of his church is blessed by encouraging words that people offer when they are struggling. An active participant in God's church is blessed by inspiration when a sermon speaks to them. As active participants in his church, we are blessed by the Prompt-to prayers prayed over us by someone in the lobby or maybe in a classroom when they know we are suffering. We are also blessed by the uplifting songs which remind us to look to God in our times of difficulty. As active participants in this church, we are blessed by the powerful teachings of scriptures which give us the strength to endure. And we are blessed with the reminder that we belong to a loving family who is happy to see us when we are here. A young lady on a spiritual search visited our church. She didn't know anyone here. She was befriended by a mature Christian lady who was also a visitor here. They decided to sit together in worship. Within time, they discussed joining the church together. 
The young lady was soon baptized after that. And on that same Sunday, that older lady placed membership with us. They both joined our adult Sunday school class together. And they have since become friends and sisters in Christ. That could never have happened if they had worshipped online only. A single mother struggled on a barely sufficient income. Several church families gathered around her in support. Some visited her home on a Saturday to make some repairs she could not afford. A few others pitched in money together to buy her children a desktop computer so they could do their schoolwork on it. That would not have happened if she had not been a part of the Assembly of the Saints. Another single mother could not afford a roof replacement she needed. When the church found out, the board helped purchase the shingles, and 15 men showed up on a Saturday to put them on. Some of the ladies of our church provided lunch for the workers, and that roof was replaced free in less than a day. She found that love and that supportive help because she was a part of the church. There is a good reason the Bible commands us in Hebrews 10, 25. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Good things happen when we worship together. That verse, by the way, uses a word which is a synonym of ecclesia. It's the Greek word pronounced synagoge, which is translated into our English synagogue. That is, the local worship place of the Jewish faith. Remember that the book of Hebrews was a letter written to the church in Jerusalem to Jewish Christians. And so terminology was used that would have resonated with them. And so they read literally, don't give up synagoguing together. If this had been written to us in our time, it would say, don't give up churching together together but that's poor English so the translators captured the spirit of the words and interpreted it this way don't give up meeting together don't give up being the church it is an instruction for us to remain faithful in coming together as God's church Holly and I raised our four children to put God's church first. And as adults in their late 30s and early 40s, they still do. And now they are raising our grandchildren to put God's church first. And we know that all of them will be a part of the church eternal. That is the greatest blessing of our lives. God's plan is to bless your life and your family through his church. And so he calls us to be actively involved in it, that we might find a place of growth, a place where our faith is nurtured and strengthened, a place of blessing, a place of service and worship together. We have been summoned to gather here for holy purposes. Let God's purposes be fulfilled in your life. If you are a Christian person, that is very clear. His purpose for you in the church is to become a part of it, actively involved, using your talents and abilities to serve others, just as you sometimes are served by others. To worship together and to raise our voices, to be a witness to this community of what God's people can do when they gather together in like faith and love one another. That's God's purpose for you. If you are not a Christian, then his purpose for you is to come to him and become a part of the family I just described, his family of believers, actively involved in an institution that makes a difference, one that serves him and one that blesses us all. And so we invite you to become a part of the ecclesia of God. Let's stand and close with our closing hymn.